Display devices, Lightning Silicon, more or less is spun out of Copen. So you heard of Copen doing OLEDs and pancake lenses. Well, this is their um, their outfit. So they're they're used in the Panasonic pancakes. You got a relationship with uh, Lakeside Lighting that is going to do their OLED manufacturing. So they're not doing the. They're basically doing the backplane design. They're doing the design of the chips and stuff like that and the design the overall design but lakeside would be the company to make the OLED devices themselves to turn the chips and put the OLED on it and to do it and one of the big things that they talk about is they need to get to the 300 millimeter or 12 inch wafer size manufacturing right now they're making on eight inch wafers the assembly is also eight inch and the problem with having only eight inch assembly is you're limited to older fabs the deal in semiconductors is to get you've got to if when you're trying to build these display devices you want really high yield this is something i learned from my l cost days you need high yield if you're going to get high yield you need to be into high yielding processes one of their they're limited right now to two two and a half k by two and a half k displays they can't get to 4k by 4k because they're on three they're building 300 inch wafers well i'm sorry 200 inch wafers or eight inch wafers eight inch wafers put you into grotty old fabs I say grotty old, but fabs that are probably um, way more than three or four generations old now. You can't build really fine features and yield them in old fabs. You need a much more modern fab with better process capability and lower defect densities to get to the high resolution. So what they're doing is they've got to get their OLED manufacturing to work and handle 12-inch wafers and build 12-inch Oh, they'll basically build OLEDs in a 12 inch assembly fab, if that makes sense. So, um, so they're working with Lakeside to get this uh, large fab technology, and that'll let them move on to 4K because they're uh, the irony is you might say, why are they limited? Because their assembly is limited. Well, because their assembly is limited, they can't get the high advanced semiconductors because the advanced semiconductors mean you have to go to bigger wafers. So it's kind of all gets kind of tied together. They're one of the first guys really out there promoting an all plastic pancake op. They take some level of pride to say, hey, we were predicting this all like five years ago. And they were. They've been they've been talking about this since they got into OLEDs. You know, they make claims to invented it. I've heard other people claim to invent in pancake optics. I don't know what all the story is on that. Ray and Tech is probably the go-to guy in, in um, LCOS right now. My old company still around. Cindian is around. Rantech um, does LCOS. They're also dabbling in being the backplane provider for OLED. They don't do the OLEDs themselves, but they are are doing some work in the uh, OLED on silicon and and LED on silicon. So they're they're you know if you've got the technology to do optical designs and things like that, they are looking at at that. They have a a a low cost way of getting to 4K. It's kind of in between pixel shifting, but it has some technology within the cell. So they're they're doing a sort of a complex cell that can give them effectively a 4K display, although they don't have all the elements there. So they're, I think what they're having is they have all the mirrors of a 4K display, but they kind of share some of the, the underlying circuitry, if I remember it. But anyway, the Rantech's one of the, the, the go-to people right now in LCOS. They're out of Korea. Um, I don't know as much about May. They kind of showed up about three years ago at CES, and I never quite understood them. But they're also out of Korea, and they're also making LCOS technology. But I don't know a whole lot about them, but I, I wanted to mention them since they were there at the show. Speaking of uh, LCOS companies, uh, Copen owns Fourth Dimension Display. Um, Somewhat interestingly, historically, my very first company I worked on in 98, we developed an XGA, which is 6, 1020, uh, 1024 by 768. Turned out I was working with a company at then called CRL Research, which through some machinations and whatnot became Copen. And their very first display device for fourth dimension displays was used the backplane, the, the silicon. They couldn't get their silicon working. They were mostly experts in the chemistry of doing LCOS. So for a while there, they licensed, for quite a few years, they licensed the backplane that I designed. So I have known, known of them for a long time. They're mostly in the high end now. They're, they're doing a thing called ferroelectric LCOS, which is a fa faster switching LCOS. 
were in the red cameras for a while, but I think that's been replaced by OLEDs. A lot of their technology is used for imaging and SLAM and whatnot. They're doing um, uh, various forms of spatial things to, to get like to illuminate them with lasers and to broadcast it out there. But they're basically in the high end of the of the L cost type market, looking at high end type uh, uh, markets. So they're doing phase gratings, high end displays, and so forth. Texas Instruments DLP. You know, for a while there, I thought they were getting out because I, I saw things disappearing. I mean, um, DigiLens used to be a DLP. Now they, they moved to LCOS. Uh, I saw a general trend. There's a company called C-Real who's doing a light field display. They were DLP. They moved to LCOS. So I've seen a, a lot of movement. Uh, I've never seen anybody go from LCOS. I can't remember anybody going from LCOS to DLP. But I've seen about four or five companies switch from using DLP to LCOS. Common thing is it's a cost, power. This is a near-eye display, not projectors. They they still are, you know, they uh, Sony tried to do LCOS projectors. And I think they pretty well failed in the commercial market. They're still out there in the uh, consumer market with them, them and JVC. But in the in the big projector market, it's almost all still DLP now. Uh, but it, they 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 are. Still making an effort. Now, they are working also in HUD, which is another field, and I actually used DLP and HUD design uh, back in the 2013, 2014 era. I did a HUD design with DLP. So they're, 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 they're definitely got some market in the HUD. They're, they're being used. I know um, Continental, I believe, is using DLP in them. So I understand that market, but they've had a really hard time cracking the ARVR market. They were in they were also in the uh, Snap. You know, Snap, who bought uh, Wave Optics, was using DLP. Even Wave Optics, before they were acquired by Snap, were indicating that they were doing their new designs were all going to be all caught. DLP says they're not giving up. They they are. They say they're making efforts and they're doing things to reduce the engine. But they are still doing development aimed at the uh, at the near eye display market, the see through AR market. View Real Micro LED. They were um, this is an LED, micro LED company. They were doing um, both direct view, and I think that's a better direction for them. Frankly, they also they started out doing micro displays, like they were. Doing, they've got the three chips here, red, green, and blue. They were also doing some direct view stuff, some of which I got to see behind closed doors, and I can't talk about. Now their big thing is to do a pick and play spatial color. So for micro displays. You, basically, they have to do the LED on on a device, a device, and it does one color, red, green, or blue. They've got a technology for the direct view. They can do a pick and place. They have a, and they won't. They don't. It's their secret sauce. But what they have is a technology where they can pick and place. So that, they're an interesting technology. They they were um, their displays look pretty good, and they claim to have some contracts with some big guys. So we'll see how that turns out. But they're they're Somebody to be at least keep an eye on. Uh, Mojo is kind of recovering in, in my regards. Uh, uh, as I said, I, I I I believe that the Mojo Vision contact lens was a scam. I've I've said that publicly. I I still think that Mojo Vision has been totally recapitalized and and redone. They're now doing a. They now focus, and this is from their presentation at um, at the ARVRMR. They're now focused on doing a spatial color with using um, uh, their own developed, they claim to have developed uh, their own quantum dot technology. So what they're trying to do is say, look, we developed a really tiny micro LED. So we've got a really tiny inorganic micro LED. And what we want to do is we want to take that micro LED and sell it as a product independent of, and, and forgetting about the contact lens. So now... Mojo Vision is becoming strictly a micro LED company. Their technology is to have always a blue LED saying that, hey, you can make blue LEDs the best on a single substrate. We can do that. Then we can print a green conversion and a red conversion. And then they can do, you know, they can do quantum dots. They can put micro lenses on them to try to collimate or try to improve the brightness. You know, one of the big things you can do is with the lens is you can take Basically, what you're doing is you're not changing the total amount of light output. What you're trying to do is concentrate it. And the smaller you can make LEDs and the tighter you can pack them together, the more efficient you can collimate them. It's just a basic thing called Eton do, and it's the law of physics. It basically says that the smaller the light emitter, 
the the better you can collimate the light. If it's a these are basically Lambertian emitters or very uh, a cosine curve emitters. This is from their presentation at at um, at the ARVRMR. Another company at the show talking about micro LEDs with Porotech. And their big claim to fame is having micro LEDs with a single emitter for all colors. Uh, that has a big at tondu advantage because now you only have that. We talked about before, you want to make the LEDs as small as possible. In their case, you only have a single LED to place. In theory, that simplifies life because you only have one connection to make. Instead of three different LEDs to connect up, you only have one to yield. But there's some issues. Uh, a lot of people in the industry tell me that they don't believe that Parotech is going to be able to get red, red this way. There's a lot of people who, this is, while Parotech is claimed to fame as this, it's well known in the industry by many, many scientists and people who know, really know LEDs that, yeah, by changing current to, L, to a uh, LED emitter, you can change the color. That's been known for a long time that you can change the color that way. Uh, the question that, that that's big on Porotech is even with their their technology and the way they're doing things, can they really get the efficiency, particularly out of red? A lot of people are questioning their red efficiency and their production ability to produce it. The other issue for Porotech is that it's a very complicated drive scheme because the current level is what controls the color. So based on current, you get color. So in order to control the brightness, you have to do pulse width modulation. You have to change the duration. Nobody really has nobody has a backplane technology that can really accurately control both current and pulse width at the same time. So the and then the issue you get into is well, how do you get enough light out of this thing, and how do you get it bright enough? If you've got this problem in red, you've got to share now the red, green, and blue. You've now got to time sequence them, and you might have to have that red on for a long period of time in order to get enough red light out. And that kind of problem. Um, plus, the drive scheme is very complicated, so it's unclear. It's very unclear how long it's going to take Porotech to ever get this thing to market. One of those things you're in the wild enthusiasm stage a year or so ago is wild enthusiasm. Hey, single emitter makes sense, solves this problem. But that's this is a problem with sort of target fixation that you say, well, the problem that's beating me on the head right now is how do I get the Aton do down? How do I get that LED really small to get really good collimated light? Well, that's one problem, but the other problem you have to say is, well, how am I going to control this thing? How am I going to make this thing? How efficient is it going to be? So we'll we'll see how they solve it. They're continuing to make progress. I know they moved to a new facility in Cambridge. This is uh, in my category of a, what a, a great technology, but why did you bother? Uh, a company called Brilliance. And what they've got is a silicon chip laser combiner. So what they've got, if you look here real carefully, uh, they have a red, green, and blue laser, and kind of built onto a silicon chip. These are this is these this is from a silicon chip. They can combine the red, green, and blue lasers into a single beam. So it's a very effective way they claim to turn a a set of three lasers into a laser emitter. So what they can do is, and the, the obvious use for this would be with a laser beam scanner. The problem is not with the lasers, it's not with the ability to combine the lasers. The problem I always make is you can't move that mirror very fast. It's very, it's extremely difficult to get a good image off of a laser beam scanner because you're limited by that mirror scan and the mirror accuracy of scan. The, the scanning is always somewhat nonlinear. It's nonlinear in speed. It's also kind of curves a little bit. It generally curves differently as you go up and down the display. All those factors work against it. And generally, you just can't move the mirror fast enough. So while this is an interesting technology for combining lasers, um, I don't see where it's going in the display area because I, I think laser beam scanning is, is fatally flawed. You know, they kind of talk about small and light and whatnot. The problem I see is I've yet to see a laser beam scanning display that looks halfway decent. Um, that just you can't you can't get there, and you're limited by the mirror the mirror swinging frequency. Now I make a very different claim.